Hello, and welcome to the Catholic Art Institute podcast. I'm your host, Kathleen Carr. I'm the president and co-founder of the Catholic Art Institute. And today I'm joined by Father Joshua Caswell, the Superior General of the Canons Regular of St. John Cantius, um, and also co-founder of the Catholic Art Institute. Welcome to the program, Father Father Joshua. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's a joy to be on. I'm delighted these podcasts are uh, happening. I've enjoyed the ones you've produced very much, and I look forward to, to more. A lot of great guests. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so it's the best we can do with COVID going on, and unfortunately we can't host our events in person, but still we are happy to offer all of these enriching conversations and educational um, talks online. So it's a new opportunity for us. So today, um, we wanted to take this opportunity to talk about the organization to help people understand who we are and what our mission is. And uh, so this is a little bit of a different podcast that we're doing today, um, but we're hoping to, to really share about the history and what it is that we're doing and why our events are the way they are. So um, maybe we could, you could start by uh, talking a little sure. bit about the organization here. Absolutely. So, yeah, I'm, I'm privileged to be the uh, Superior General of the Canons Regular of St. John Cantius. I oversee uh, 24 members and two dioceses and uh, four parishes, and it's a growing community, new vocations. Uh, I know that you and I go way back, um, but our relationship and relationship of the Art Institute with the Canons Regular goes back many years uh, to, of course, Father Phillips. But uh, I, I, I really see that it's been such a gift to see the work of the Art Institute flourish under the umbrella of the charism of our community. So the Canons Regular are a new religious community, as you know, and um, as a new community, we've had many areas of renaissance, whether it's been in a sacred liturgy teaching the extraordinary form, or whether it's been altar serving or sacred music. But one area that we always had a vision for was having an organization for, for the arts. And that was when, um, uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit, that I met you several years ago, and you had um, been, you know, you had seen and heard about Saint John Cantus through a video, and you had heard about that the miracle of the jug, and uh, that's an important part of our charism. Um, the canon's mission is restoring the sacred, and a big part of that is this image of Saint John Cantus that's found on our, on our altar, and it's a, it's a symbol of restoration. Uh, the story is very simple. This young girl was walking across this square on her way to sell milk, and she tripped and she broke the jug, and the pieces of the jug fell apart and the milk spilled out. But along walks our patron saint, Father John Cantius, and he picks up the pieces of the jug, and he restores it, and he makes it whole, whole again. And so that, our charism is putting up, taking the broken pieces, putting them together. It's a very clear image. So in our coat of arms, we have, of course, that restored jug. And I know that the Catholic Art Institute also has that restored jug or that jug in need of restoration. So. That's correct. And ours resides inside the quatrefoil, which is a symbol of evangelization, which is one of the, um, one of the things that we are trying to do with this organization because our artistic gifts are, are, are gifts, so they're for others and they're, they're God would like to use these gifts to bring people to himself. And so this organization has been founded to help support that. So supporting the artists in their work um, and also um, putting a focus on beauty, evangelizing through beauty, and ultimately hoping to restore the culture because unfortunately there are some challenges with things in the culture that we're trying to address and bringing people to God through the beauty is that I, the way that we believe this is forward and the way forward with it. And we feel that it's so necessary to be nourished by the Holy Mass. And you know, that was one of the most amazing things. When you first came to us, uh, we had met, but then you first came to us and you submitted a proposal to our founder, Father Phillips, uh, which I passed on to him. But one of the most amazing things, you examined why many arts organizations fail or fizzle out after time. Because an arts organization is not just some group of people meeting in a church basement having cookies and Kool-Aid. It's something much more, it's something much, much more real. And so when you came to us with this vision, uh, you one of the things you said is that the arts organizations of history were always in some way near the altar. 
So there was always a religious order that was some ways the center of, of that, you know, that, that evangelization. And your comment that all or art flows to and from the altar, that art must flow to and from the altar was so important. And that was, we, we realized that this might actually work because we want to support the Catholic Art Institute by connecting it to the altar. Why does art exist? Uh, the catechism gives us a very clear, you know, direction on sacred art. In incidentally, this is under um, truth. Thou shalt not lie in the, in the commandments. Thou shalt not lie in the, in the catechism. There's the two purposes of art. Art must uh, glorify God, number one, and to edify the people. But the glorifying of God happens especially at the Holy Mass. And so that's why, you know, our partnership with Canons Regular and the Catholic Art Institute is being able to, for any new member, they're enrolled in a mass association. So we actually remember the artists and their work at the altar. We pray for the artist's work. And we want people to, you know, create art that edifies people, that glorifies God. And why would this be under, under truth in the catechism? Well, because as Keith says, uh, truth is beauty and beauty is truth. So That's right. And the, the three are always together. They're considered the transcendentals. And if you pull down one, the other two would go with it. Um, but there are also avenues for conversion in, in people's lives. And some people sometimes are, find a logical way into the church. They read their way in. But so often people are only brought to that interest in exploring the faith by an experience, and that experience happens through beauty. And it's so beautifully showcased in the liturgies here at St. John Cantius that it seemed the perfect fit for this organization. And it's one of my um, great uh, privileges to invite our members and guests who oftentimes come from around the country for our annual conference, who are enriched and nourished by the liturgy here. Um, but it really shows how the arts are working in an integral way in the liturgy here. Everything, the architecture, the arts, the statues, the instruments of the mass, the vestments. It's, it's um, giving the best to God, using our gifts for the best uh, for God. It's giving people an experience of heaven, which is really what is happening at the mass and the church building's purpose. So because it's working so well here, this is obviously why you have so many conversions, and I just think it's a model to be followed. So that's why it's such a privilege to have this organization here and supported by the Mass. Um, and as you said, it's a very cyclical thing. We're being nourished by it. We bring people to it. That's kind of what our gifts are for. And hopefully it can be inspiring for people to do this elsewhere. But it's, it's the way that I write, I think, is the way forward to restoring a sense of the culture. You know, and, and our hope, too, is to give um, artists opportunities that are not generally in the culture. Um, and this is what governs the way we do our events. We believe that there's a very big need for education. Um, and there are things that you wouldn't get in art college. For example, and we really hope to start expanding our offerings, Catholic art history. So I have to say, um, I cannot believe what the Catholic Art Institute has been able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. I remember when you first brought the vision forward and we had some plans and then you said, what if we could have like an art, uh, an art conference? And uh, it was an annual conference and I thought, I don't think this is ever possible. But lo and behold, the first annual uh, Catholic Art Institute conference occurred at the Drake Hotel. And among the speakers was the, uh, God rest his soul, Sir Roger Scruton, you know, not a Catholic, but these, these, these speakers who came from the greatest leaders in philosophy and art and culture, and they gathered, it was like a symposium of, of ideas, but in a very grand setting. And uh, I think this was Sir Roger Scruton's first uh, Latin Trinity Mass. And so he got to experience the sacred liturgy, in the Catholic context, remember how moved he was. But just, just seeing what the Art Institute has been able to accomplish, uh, whether it was Alexander Stoddart, whether it was uh, great workshops in stained glass, um, illuminated miniatures, you had um, drawing, classical drawing. So it wasn't just people sitting around discussing ideas, but actually people learning the skills and teaching the, the talents. And it, it's been really amazing because I think that that sort of shows that the vision took real root because it, there, there's real fruit that, that God actually produced out of this. And I know it's been a lot of suffering as when you do any evangelization, <laughs> when you do any work for the church, you're going to suffer. But it, it's, it, it matters because um, as you said, 
I can't just give truth to everyone. Truth is not easy to swallow. But when you can take truth and clothe it in beauty, oh my goodness, I can open our doors and I watch people come in and they are, even if they may disagree fundamentally with some of the tenets of the church, they assent by their will to the expressions of art, to the music, to the beauty of, of a sacred painting. And those things move their heart up and little do they know it, they're actually agreeing with truth. That's of course truth incarnate. So. Yeah, that's beautifully put. And it's obviously been an experience here of a lot of people. And maybe they are coming into the church not understanding certain things or with preconceived ideas, but are willing to explore because they're so touched and moved by that experience of beauty. And I know that that's been an experience of, of several members and, you know, there's been amazing conversions here. And it's a beautiful thing to witness. And that helps our mission because we're hoping to evangelize through beauty. Um, but you're, you're correct in that we are also trying to offer not only educational talks, hosting the you know top thought leaders, architects, but offering those old world skills that are oftentimes not available. And I, sometimes people aren't aware of some of the challenges that go on in university settings. Uh, there's been loss of skill building in certain circumstances. So it's a real pleasure to be able to offer gilding workshops, medieval uh, illumination, using old world materials, stained glass, because there are things that are not available elsewhere. And we're trying to, you know, maintain and propagate these. I remember walking into one of the workshops and um, just walking in and seeing these people from around the city of Chicago. And there they are pouring lapis lazuli onto sheepskin vellum. It was like, it was like amazing because that's actually what you are doing. You're actually bringing real world skills like watching the way that they, they learn these procedures and uh, and you've had some very good teachers and some very good people that you can collaborate with. And that's one of the reasons why, not only because it's attached to the Holy Mass, attached to a, uh, a religious order, but one of the reasons why I believe that the Catholic Art Institute will thrive is because you have so many collaborators who are so skilled and you are drawing from a, a great pool of artists and people who are really bringing these old world skills to the future. So. That's true. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> and some of this has just come from lived experience myself because I'm a traditionally pa a trained painter. But I didn't come out of art college that way. I came out with a painting degree and I discovered that there are other techniques that I could learn this atelier style painting. So I, over time, uh, studied that and wanted to share that because it was a revelation to me that there are rigors and certain uh, techniques that, that can be learned that will really help all artists to express themselves better when you have those guidelines, you know, those, those skills and gifts. And that's something you've always held to and you've always repeated over and over again is that art isn't just about expressing yourself without discipline. It requires discipline and training. And you've mentioned that the arts world is the only field of study where people are just told to express themselves without real training and skill. Like imagine a, music, a musician just being told to express themselves without having a voice training. And I think that's, um, that's something which I see you recapturing in the art world is, is the strength that art is, is recapturing its true north. That art is getting again its center because beauty is objective and the church has spoken on it and there's certain rules that must be followed. That's true. And Christ was incarnate and, uh, a visible person and intelligible and therefore um, th this is the way the arts should be as well and there are certain things that are fitting so it, you know Dr. De Dennis McNamara talked about this in his recent podcast you know I don't have anything personally against abstract painting but it's just not fitting for the liturgy because you know there's a catechetical dimension to the art that is, is teaching and communicating and drawing a person you know to something higher than themselves and it, it, it has to be legible, and this is what realism uh, lends itself to. So mm -hmm. that's why we're hoping to foster those skills and techniques. And then the movements that have come in the church, too. We, we want to focus on those because there's so much that the church influenced and what was going on historically influenced the, the types of art that resulted. You know, the House of Trent, for in particular, you know, had a very big... In reaction to the iconoclasm that had happened in the Reformation, you know, trying to get rid of the beauty and the um, the arts and the Baroque period and the beauty that flowed from that as a result. 
And these are just interesting, beautiful things that oftentimes are not discussed in, you know, a secular art program. And we're, we're delighted to work on offering those and educate uh, everyday people, artists. You know, this organization is is really to put the information in the hands of anybody that is drawn to beauty and drawn to be a, a custodian of beauty, as St. John Paul of the Great put it, I thought it was a really beautiful way of expressing what an artist is, or those just drawn to the arts to, to mm -hmm. foster and protect. Um, we are all can be uh, playing a role as custodians of beauty that way. So. One of the things that I'm, I, I love about the Catholic Art Institute is that it connects artists, real artists, with each other. Very often there can be a lie that an artist feels alone or that or that like they're fighting against the culture, them themselves. But I know that through the Catholic Art Institute, whether you're members from Canada, USA, you have members all over who are members of our masses, but I know that you're drawing them together. And even with this um, art competition you have, so I know that you're, you're inviting artists to submit work and you have a jury competition. Uh, and you're, you're able to give a price, you're able to recognize, but you are drawing out from the woodwork these people who may have formerly felt alone or felt as if they were by themselves struggling against this tide of culture which says beauty is not objective, beauty is subjective. And finally, here's a voice that's saying, no, there is a true north, we have to follow this, there's discipline. And so I'm seeing it because if there's one thing the enemy wants to do, the enemy wants to keep people apart. You know, the word diabolical means to divide. But I see the, the unity happening not only in our religious order, through our parishes, we're bringing people together, but I see that the Catholic Art Institute is able to bring people together. And, uh, and that's and that they, they see that they are not alone, that there are other people like me who also believe that beauty is, is objective and that skills must be taught. And it's not just talent. And that's, that's been impressive to watch. Thank you. Well, we're very pleased to offer this first uh, online, it's an online competition. And we're hoping to showcase good work um, and, and help artists to sell it and award them, give them a monetary award. And um, it's, this competition I think is a, is a good opportunity for artists. They, they won't have to ship their work. It's not gonna be a great deal of cost to them, but there's a lot of things that can be a benefit in the long run, the prize money, the exposure. Um, our juror is Donna, uh, Dr. Dennis McNamara and he works on so many church restoration projects and new projects, uh, working with architects to commission work. So it's a great opportunity for artists that are working to get their work seen by him and you know, they, he can become familiar with their, their work. Um, and generally there just isn't a lot of support in the wider culture for something like this. So we are creating opportunities that are like things that you would find in the culture, but where a granting institution is not going to grant or show religious artwork. We sure. are creating that. So we're really proud of that. It's exciting. And this is just a prelude to what we hope to do at next year's conference, which is to have an actual show in person. And then our very, you know, esteemed guests will get to view the work in person. The work can be sold. And there will also be larger prize money involved um, and an award ceremony at the conference, which is our best event. It's mm -hmm. inspiring and great fun. And it's just educational and great networking opportunity and uh, just a great social um, event. Amazing. One of the things I, I really hope happens in the future too with the Catholic Art Institute is that I know as a pastor that there are so many pastors out there who are uh, in search of, let's say they want to do a church restoration or they want a painting or they want a commission and it's difficult to find, where do you find an artist uh, who can do something that's going to be beautiful and fitting and edifying to God in, in the church. And I hope that the Catholic Art Institute can become that, that resource for pastors or people looking for an artist, that you know this artist is a member of the Catholic Art Institute and, and you can employ them in your parish because I know that there are many pastors who are looking to have new works of art done. As, as we have here, many of our parishioners have seen our works of art done in the church that have been done by members of the Catholic Art Institute. So like this stuff, it's not just a theory that happens where you just thinking and talking, but it actually, it's gonna make it into your churches, you know? Yeah. We hope that the end result is that artworks will flood into churches and parishes, so. Yeah, some real tangible uh, su support and help for artists working today, because it's, it didn't end with Caravaggio. There's still a lot of great work that's being made and needs to be made, uh, and we're so delighted that we can, we can offer this uh, opportunity. And you're right, 
so in addition to the kind of prize money and the ability to sell the work directly, we are going to be showcasing those that are uh, selected for this competition and the ones in the future on our website and also on our podcast. So we'd like to speak to the artists, let them talk about their work. And then we're going to have our, you know, a directory on our website for exactly what you're discussing. You know, priests that would like to commission work will be able to use this as a resource. You know? Beautiful. So okay. I, I know pastors who are watching are very excited by that because uh, I, I know the struggle is real, you know? <laughs> How do you just go to your local art school and find some person to express themselves? It has to be in a fitting way. And then this is when, you know, I, it's no secret that the last 50 years have been, I mean, disastrous for, for the arts. I don't know what happened. We saw it everywhere in the whitewashing of churches and the building of churches, but I think that there is a, there, there's a way forward. And this is why I believe the image of the broken jug as it, in your logo is so appropriate because it, you really are picking up the pieces of postmodernism. You're picking up those broken pieces and you're hopefully trying to put them back together and have some restoration there where we can begin to use these works of art for the glory of God. So. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we're doing. And we know that the, the education is a big part of that. The education and, and the grace that comes from the Mass. So it's all happening. And praise be to God, this is growing, you know, because as you said, when we first met and began this, it was a lot of dreams and that have become realities far beyond, I know for me, beyond what I ever imagined was going to happen. So I know who would have thought, you know, having 300 people at the Drake Hotel in the Gold Coast Room, Roger Scruton, you know, Alexander Stoddart, uh, you had other great speakers, I can, you know, at Julia Aristides, uh, some of my favorites, but those were fun moments where I'm going, what on earth is happening? And people came out of the woodwork. We had people come from Brazil, we had people come from other countries. That's right. uh, it was just this coming together of, wow, we are not alone. And, and here's a beautiful setting. Here's a beautiful dinner and a beautiful uh, way for people to see that, you know what? We have a mission, and that is to restore the, the sacred in religious art. That's right. And it was a beautiful thing to have an event that's focused on restoring beauty in it, an inspiring setting like that. Because, as you said, there was a bit of a wreckage happening in the past 50 years. And when I was doing my research in organizations, it really was, it was the panel basement. And, you know, not so, not so great, you know, because we're talking about restoring with beauty and everything's about beauty, then it seems so fitting to hold the events and places that are inspiring too. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I never, ever imagined myself working with, with artists. I, <laughs> I, I'm not an artist, uh, and there, there are pros and cons. The pros that you're working with artists, and the cons that you're working with artists. So it's, it's been an experience, and something I never, I never imagined, and it's, but it's, it's, it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful because artists see, you know, I, I'm a priest, I offer Mass, and when I offer Mass, I bring the intangible reality of God down to the altar. But an artist, too, is a type of priest because they're bringing the forms that they see into reality. You know, I love this story, even as tragic as it is about Bernini, after he created those beautiful sculptures in, in Rome uh, by the chair of St. Peter, the four doctors. He created those beautiful sculptures, and after they were blessed and dedicated, he snuck back into St. Peter's and he wanted to destroy them. Uh, and I, you know, I know this is how artists feel because there's, they see a form, they see a reality, and they have to make that in. And that's the thing is, for a priest, we're trying to make God incarnate in the world again. For any Christian, we make God incarnate in the world again by our own yes. And so in some ways, we're all sort of artists, but artists in a particular way, they are both blessed and cursed with seeing. It's like having perfect pitch. Once you see, can you accept anything less? And that's, I think, a real struggle. Like Bennett the 16th says about beauty, you know, beauty wounds us, but also gives us wings to bear us a lot. So it's always a two-edged sword. As you, as you know, we've walked this path for um, now four years. I'm not even sure how many years, but... Six, 2014 is when we met, so gosh, six years. Six, six yeah. years. Yeah. And it's been incredible, the amount of people that have come together and been convicted by the work of, of beauty and your, your very important work. And you're working with great organizations like um, Granda, Prado Gali. Um, you've got other organizations that are also eager to sponsor your events. So, yes, we're very blessed, and we have good partnerships. Yeah, it just keeps expanding, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, and yes, you're right to your point that you know artists having to create and recreate um, 
But putting that focus back on that is for others because in the culture, the culture will tell you that it's only about self-expression. And it's sort of a dead end and that can be very difficult for an artist. And it's so refreshing to understand that you do have a role and it is for others. And God has created this thing where the culture sometimes tells you there's either no need for art. You know, we have a totalitarian, utilitarian uh, ideology oftentimes in the culture. And so we're really also uh, giving hope to artists um, that their gifts are needed and more than I think people realize. They, they didn't matter. And that was the message of, of course, um, Sir Roger Scrooge, right? The most useless, th useless things are the most useful. Like what we see as useless, like adornment, beauty, it is the thrown away transcendental. But people say, no, just make a, a box. You know, we don't need the extras. R right. But the human spirit, you're denying the soul. We need the extras. We need that that form. And you're absolutely right. I've seen that. Um, that we can preach that. No, the most useless things are the most useful. And that, of course, is the things which adorn our church and which adorn the sacred liturgy. You know. Right, and they're, they're beyond just adornment. So often there, there's rich symbolism that's necessary there, that the church has a certain shape that has theological reasons for being there and the symbolism that's in it. Um, your tour the other day with um, the Protestant that wanted to come and see the church, and you went so beautifully through that, and it's good for people to understand that because I think oftentimes people are cowed by the culture. You're not allowed to have an opinion. You know, we the elites, you know, there'll be a pile of trash and you have to say that's art and you're sitting there thinking, but that looks like a pile of trash. And indeed you are correct, it is a pile of trash, you know. And you're allowed to have that opinion. And, and this is helpful having this organization to tell people, yes, I'm having a reaction to the church that looks like a pizza hut. Why is this spiritually? Why is it not as um, fitting to God? Because this is really what we are doing with our gifts. We're trying to give the best to God. So it's it's for God. We are donating ourselves. Yes, there's a lot of sacrifice in creating art, you know, focus, time to make something beautiful and skilled. It takes a lot of time and hard work and sacrifice, but that is the gift that we give to God. People's donations that help that is the gift we give to God. But then these are things that are lasting and useful forever, as you were sort of saying, to, to go back to your point. Because what do we have here at St. John Cantus? parishioners a hundred years ago giving a month's salary or something over a period of time to build this beautiful church and for decades now it is a gift for people and still to this day it's, you know i feel so blessed i cannot believe that i get to be the pastor of this church and i what have i done not really a lot you know we are building on the shoulders of these poor immigrants who gave everything they had because they knew what was important the glory of god through in concrete form in a church building that that's beautiful and that's something that I hope the Catholic Art Institute will help not only artists and, you know, but the whole the need for patronage. We do not have today patrons of the arts anymore. In the past, you would have people who, you know, are able to make a good living and they have the money to support the arts. And that's actually one of the things that any, for any viewers who are watching, I would hope that you would have that opportunity to see that how important it is to commission art, how important it is to support organizations like the Catholic Art Institute because um, the need for patronage is so important. The artist cannot work without um, without material sustenance. You know, the whole uh, stereotype of the starving artist is a very real one. But uh, it's it's in some ways we need those resources so that you can continue to work with the greatest materials and the greatest skills you train. That's right, and you know we want to change the culture, and it's possible when we all work together corporately. So you know, some people have you know more means, and that they can help. We're always thrilled with whatever anybody is able to do to help us. So, you know, renewing membership, donations large and small, all of these things contribute in that patchwork, which is, I think, as I said, oftentimes, you know, the Corinthians reading of the, of the hand doesn't tell, you know, we all have our roles to play exactly. in the church as, as mm -hmm. patrons and artists and, and uh, those various things. So, yes, that's a good point because um, it is, it's challenging. And I would also encourage anybody who's watching who is not a member of the Catholic Art Institute, you don't have to be an artist to be a member. Uh, one of the benefits of membership and being involved in the Catholic Art Institute is that uh, your work and you are remembered in our masses at our altar. Every single week there's a mass offered. You get a beautiful certificate of membership, but also your, your dues help to support artists and other great work. So that's something I would encourage you. If you're not a member, consider signing up for a membership today. Thank you, yes, it helps um, put on our events, you know, because it's not free to 
fly people in when we have them on or you know sometimes there's a little bit of a speaker's fee people's time is worth money and you know it just takes time and effort to, to host events and do things and pay for our website and all the things we have to do to be in the real world so we are so grateful for our, our members and patrons so yes thank you for mentioning well that. i'm so excited uh, for the future of the Catholic Art Institute. I think you're on a great track. You've had a great resume and a great foundation. And I think that you can only go forward. And I think that it matters more than ever now. Uh, and and I'm, I'm excited to see that. So. Thank you. And thanks so much for the support here. We're so delighted that we can be connected to St. John Cantius. It's just uh, an amazing parish. And we're just so grateful for the support and for your time today. So thanks for joining me, Father Joshua. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you.